Octung the Vox of YouTube. It's me again, your pal Nani, and we are back again with another exciting Let's Explain Victoria 2. Today we're going to be talking a lot about Heart of Darkness. In fact, it's the only thing we'll be talking about through the entire video, just what's changed. Mostly what's changed, particularly with uh, these tabs up here. But I'm also going to talk about what I like in this game, in the new uh, edition, and what I don't like. So before you, but before I even go into that, I'm just going to come with this forewarning. I am going to rip into this expansion a lot. I'm going to be honest here, I don't like it as much as I like AHD on release. And with that being said, I do see though, most of the problems I have and most of the problems that the general people have are things that can be pretty easily uh, patched in the uh, first few releases. The first thing I'm going to point out is there's a few, more, a few new things just in the world, particularly this. You remember how it, before there was quite a bit of precious metal in the world, uh, a few sources that got it pretty much instantly as soon as the game started? Well, South Africa now completely is abandoned as far as uh, precious metals go. And even worse than that, Johor does not start with any. The soonest they usually get them by event is like 20 years into the game, and even then they only get like one to two provinces with precious metals in them. So with that being said, a lot of our unsaved nations and a lot of our starting economies have been nerfed a lot. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Japan's changed color. Uh, a few places have new borders, and a few regions have new names. Nothing particularly major. So, with that now being said, let's go through the whole tab. Let's go through all the tabs and talk about, you know, just what's changed. First things first, those people who, those people who were questioning what I was talking about when I said to put your factories in like regions, well, now that's no longer going to be so confusing. Uh, factory throughput is now tied to actually being actual distance between factory and uh, uh, geo. If you got a factory that's uh, in the same region as a uh, one of the materials it makes, it gets a big throughput boost for that particular resource. For instance, in Sicily, if we put down a factory that consumes sulfur, considering that it has not one but two sulfur prov provinces, that increases the throughput as is, but in addition, having railroads in these provinces, as well as uh, the province, er, in these two provinces, as well as the region in general, are also going to increase throughput. So with that being said, it's a little bit easier now to try and uh, expand your industrial empire logically. In addition to that, uh, like factories now cooperate. Uh, not only do you get the thoroughput bonus from region for that as well, so say uh, if this makes fertilizer and I'm using fertilizer to make explosion explosives, I can also uh, build an explosive factory down here and it will consume the fertilizer being produced at the first factory we, we made. Uh, it also will, the like factories will also now cooperate with each other more, so instead of having, say, canned food factories, or, well, no, that's a bad example. Instead of having, say, regular clothes factories sell to, the, sell to the world markets first, and then your luxury clothes factories, which need them as a resource, they will first seek actual buyers in your territory now, particularly factories, the government, etc., which really helps improve the economic resource AI. And, uh, with that now being said, moving on to budget, uh, I apologize for my horrendous balance right now. I just ran the scenario for 18 days without touching anything, to prove an example later. Uh, our budget screen is a bit different now. Best thing first, our national stockpile is now not one, just one big omni-important slider, it's now three smaller, but still very important sliders. Your army supply, your naval supply, and your construction supply. Army goods are for army goods are for the actual uh, the actual distribution of the supplies you make in your RGOs and uh, ensuring that your soldiers are properly organized, etc. Naval naval uh, naval spending goes directly towards reparation of ships, maintenance of ships. <coughs> 
Yeah, sorry about that. <coughs> Supply of ships, organization of crew, etc., etc., etc. This is a pretty big slider nowadays. In fact, it's so important that you literally cannot lower it down to 0%. It, it can only go down as low as 30. Your construction uh, is not simply uh, factories and railroads and the like. It also is uh, buying up resources for the actual production of units, which also goes hand in hand with military spending. Construction prioritizes the uh, railways and forts and the like, but will also go towards the building, particularly of the navies. Your military spending is what gives you most of your, particularly your cash to build soldiers, but what we're reducing the cost of soldiers and their goods and the like, and their payment, of course, to keep morale high and the like. But it also now affects the actual purchasing of small arms and other direct military construction goods, which is nice. I don't know why a lot of our artisans are just choosing to starve themselves. I'm not even taking that much out of them. Technology has changed a lot, so we're going to go th down through everything. One of the biggest things that got changed are pretty much all the army technologies. But before I even go into these, I'm actually going to skip ahead down a while to the military. Your armies now have got are going to be a lot more varied. Instead of the completely historic problem you would get where you would get Cuirassiers and Hus and Hussars at like the very end of the game where they were pretty much useless at this point, Cavalry has now been demoted to pretty much an irregular free uh, version reconnaissance unit, while Dragoons, Cuirassiers, and Hussars now fill their role. To basically go down it like I did my regular video, a lot of units actually got changed, so I'm just going to do that again. The regulars have pretty much been untouched, are still just cheapo versions of normal infantry, who will now, even post guard, still make up the brunt of your fighting force. Uh, they also get a lot of technologies to help them out, but they have a problem now where both of these guys can't really siege anything for crap. Cavalry, as said, are now mount basically mounted regulars, have basic reconnaissance value to assist basically unsieved nations or people really in debt. Basically, the mounted versions of irregular from almost every aspect. Artillery has changed the least of all, perhaps, out of all the units. Its, uh, stat, its main stat is now support. Uh, it goes off of that for the majority now. It's also ma been made less expensive to maintain, but it generally goes that we're now going to have a lot more artillery, especially for the poorer nations, and they're going to do less in battle now, it's, and so it's going to be less worth your time to just make armies that are stacked entirely against themselves with more artillery. Engineers are now also in the support line. They aren't as good as support, but what they are good at is taking down forts. That's what that siege value is for, and helping actually occupy, which they do as which they do very well as well. They're also very fast and overall pretty good units now. Instead of being something you overlook a lot of the time, engineers are going to basically become a pretty much critical part of every army you, you're going to make instead of just the ones that you expect to just bust down forts. Guards are no longer just super versions of infantry. Despite what their stats may imply, they're now basically the invader army uh, mainstay. They have excellent attack values, and, of course, excellent discipline, maneuver, max speed, etc. And they're still pretty mean to face in value, but their defense now is pretty low. In fact, it's actually lower than your conventional infantry. So, your guards are no longer... You're never longer going to have armies made, out enti made entirely out of guards. You're going to have maybe brunt... The brunt of your army is going to be infantry with, like, one or two guards to support, except if you decide to make a, an attack army or something like I like to do with Prussia to the German Empire, where you're still going to need some infantry and other support to back your guards up now, just in case they actually get attacked. They, of course, along with some of your cavalry, probably receive the most changes of all the units here in HOD. 
The three cavalry types now sort of go together in their own ways, instead of just being dragoons are better than cavalry, cuirassiers are better than dragoons, hussars are worse than cuirassiers but have different values. Now it's dragoons are pretty much your middleman, they're going to be your mainstay for your proper armies. Uh, you're going to have at least one of these probably in every proper army you actually put together from now on. Uh, they're pretty much... They pretty much adopted their role straight from cavalry, but also from themselves, in the fact that they basically get no drawback down from regular cavalry. And that's pretty much a universal... Uh, that's pretty much going to happen no matter where what version of Victoria 2 you're playing. Crossiers have now adopted, have now pretty much adopted artillery's role. They're now a lot more expensive to actually upkeep, but their attack is devastating. You are definitely going to want to have at least a few of these in your armies if you're a GP. Secondary nations might not even want to consider Crossiers because they just are very expensive. They're not very fast, they don't actually give a recon value, so they aren't that much faster at actually capturing territory now, etc, etc, etc. There's quite a few problems that they have, but there's just essentially early game. You're going to get these things earlier than guards now, instead of pretty late into it. They just devastate your enemies. Your Hussars have incredible reconnaissance value, but are basically, as far as combat itself goes, pretty much very fast, but mounted regulars. Like in real life, their attack and defense values are pretty much worthless, their only real use is flanking, which they do very well, and occupying provinces, which they do is extremely well. Having a few of these in your armies are going to make your capture rates just fly. Tanks are a little different now. They are, unlike, they are no longer strictly support units. Well, they weren't really strictly support units before. They... As with Stock Victoria 2, still fulfill that same distinct role of uh, being completely horrifying machines. Uh, their max speed is, of course, still very, you know, Victorian era tank. And their defense stat could be a lot better, but their attack is just, as you can see, just unfathomably good. Artillery techs, artillery techs as I see it, still work to improve it. It's just all around, they're just very, still very excellent, but now they're even more so because of the prevalence of cavalry on the field, mostly because, well, first things first, they get siege, which lets them occupy provinces faster, and secondly, these things eat curious seers for breakfast. So, these are going to go with your guards to effectively make super shocking attack armies, and, I mean, look at this. They have a they have an attack of 16. Our second, our secondary army right now, our, our secondary potential uh, candidate for making an army right now has half of that. So they're a lot more powerful now. I'd say they're a lot more worth their time and especially making factories for, even if they were still pretty good before. Airplanes are no longer the joke of the late game because they can actually attack now, but they're for some reason better in defense, despite the opposite being pretty much true in real life. They now, like engineers act and artillery, act from the supporting role line, secondary line, which means that, like engineers and artillery, they immediately just die if they're sent into battle alone, but with support, obviously, they're going to do pretty good jobs, and their reconnaissance just, as with regular Victoria 2, makes it so that occupying provinces is incredibly quick. In fact, I'm not going to really give you a display, I might throw it in at the end of the video or something. But, occupying is very, very much changed now. There's a lot, a lot new uh, that's done about occupying, and it basically falls on reconnaissance now. In fact, actually, I'm just going to show you that after the show. So, with that now all being said, Army Doctrine is very much more powerful now. It is probably on the same level as light armament now instead of just being for paranoid or just generally, you know, defensive nations. They still, they, for one thing, they increase your engineer support value, which helps them a lot. 
For another thing, every single event, every single one of these things has inventions that increase your defense at least by some measure. They also increase your mobilization time and and various other stats of your armies. Basically, this thing is your army model, the army doctrine. Unlike before, where light armament basically determined how advanced your army was, now army doctrine essentially makes sure that whoever, like, you can, how do I put this? You can basically say that if you have, say, point defense system, that you have a 1850 model army. In other words, it is very important now. Even for nations that aren't really going to get much mileage out of the digging cap and for max level. Light armament, however, still pretty good. Uh, your technologies are, well, first things first, your infantry, unlike your cavalry, as you're going to see, are still spread out. Uh, now your actual attack values are based on uh, the inventions you get, which are still pretty, f which are still pretty fair. I wouldn't say though that it's as good as they were. They're nearly as good as they were in four before, in fact, because you actually got a pretty low chance of discovering your next armament value. In fact, it's the only real way to increase it above five percent, where you'd be generally lucky if you actually get your technology by the time you're researching your next one. Is if you're fighting another country with the same armaments. So basically, this is, in essence, it's delayed every technology for a few years, which is a pretty big nerf. I'm not gonna lie. They also really lowered the actual useless usefulness of bolt action rifles and modern divisional. Well, they actually did make this a lot more useful than it was, to be fair. But bolt action rifles got a pretty big nerf. And it's still in the wrong place. It still is logically, you know, after breech loaded, but b before machine guns, which is just a historical, you know, just. But I think that's for balance reason at this point. Heavy armament is the only. basically the only technology tree that basically went untouched, except artillery gets more support now. Military science is actually been nerfed quite some. Uh, you get a lot more organization per tech now, and, you know, still got aeronautics to go look forward to as early as 1914, but now, instead of having all of these on the cavalries, only military plans does, well, actually, only military staff system does, where it just unlocks every single type of cavalry at once for you. So the military science tree is now no longer this in second place, it's probably right above artillery for last. Army leadership uh, gradually increases your morale now instead of just making it go way up, which balances the game quite a bit more, I think. Uh, military tactics are... it's a lot easier now to see the direct impact of morale and military tactics, and the, of course, as usual, the inventions are still pretty good, and there's still a lot of technologies that, are, that depend on this. An impression player loves this decision for the ability to kick France's ass for the next, like, 30 years, pretty much effortlessly. The Navy techs have also gone over pretty major overhauls, but despite what you would think, a lot of these are very much untouched from vanilla. It's just the change of the navies that makes them more effective. Uh, battleship, the naval doctrine is sadly nowhere as near as effective. Uh, it was not nearly buffed as much as the uh, army doctrine techs, but to be fair, it really isn't supposed to be as important. The The thing is, you want the naval bases out of them, not so much the inventions. So, it's still, you know, pretty fairly important. And the, uh, heck, I would even say that the techs you get out of them are still, or the inventions you get out of them are still pretty good. I mean, max speed increases a lot, attack increases a lot, etc. Ship construction still do exactly what they did back in Standard and AHD. Just gives you more just designs of ships to increase to choose from, and logically increases their speed due to new forms of power. Naval engineering is now a little bit more important because this tech, torpedo attacks, uh, as you can get from the naval engineering and 
Well, yeah, from the naval, naval engineering, and to an extent, a few of them from naval doctrine technologies, allow your cruisers and your, uh, allow your cruisers and your commerce freighters er, for earlier in the game to fire torpedoes, which lets them more effectively take out bigger targets. And, of course, as before, gives you a whole bunch of technologies to make your actual ships better individually. Naval engineering is probably now the savior for the smaller navies. Gives you technologies to work with smaller ships more effectively, and lets you make more out of less. It's all about making your ships more efficient, and that helps you a lot. Of course, it's not going to hurt either if you have a massive navy that's very efficient, so always, this is probably now the number two priority uh, tree, mostly due to the new technologies and, and to an extent, the, uh, the second most important tree of naval. I should clarify that. Anyway, due to all the inventions and particularly torpedoes, which helps you bo at both ends of the spectrum and, of course, in the middle. And build times are still very well accepted. Very, they help out. Well, they don't actually help out that much. A lot of the navy uh, build times are still pretty long. They're, if you want to lower your build time, you're going to generally go with naval bases more. But either way, with that now being said, naval science is still naval science. Uh, still increases your organization and supply range, which are both uh, pretty important. But as of now, it's just kind of a mid-level technology in this tree. It doesn't really have major benefits. Not very much has now been delegated to the position that the entire Navy technology in general used to be, where the only reason to really throw much into this is if you're a major naval country like the UK. Same pretty much goes with naval leadership. It's all about just more organization. Which is important, don't get me wrong, I mean, I've lost a lot of naval combat just be because even though my ships were better and the like, the uh, enemy had, had researched a lot more of the, uh, the naval leadership and naval science categories, particularly the United States since they have uh, distinct, uh, they distinctly go after these, but it still stands that these are not priority technologies, particularly if you don't go to war on the seas too often. Commerce was entirely untouched. Culture was still entirely untouched. Except for one thing. That ANMP is no longer the most important tech in the game. That now goes to machine guns. Mostly because you notice something missing? They, re they relegated it, split, split it to state and government. And while Natty and Impy still gives you a lot of the bo be same benefits it did, it is no longer like a get this as soon as it appears or your nation is going to suffer technology. It's still, of course, it is still very powerful but no longer number one. And it was all because they moved the mission to civilize back to uh, state and government. In addition, to explain something that goes along with that while I'm thinking about it, Reach-loaded rifles now give you the colonial no negotiations, which decreases the life rating of colonial provinces. And to stop you, of course, from just colonizing at the turn of 1850, uh, you have to invent machine guns, naval logistics, or economic responsibility, all 1870 techs, to actually go forward with it. I do give them bonus points that they did decide to include economic responsibility, so if you're a more uh, industrialized, uh, more pro-industrial nation, like the Orange Free State, where you'd be logically colonizing, but you wouldn't logically be pumping a lot of money into your military, keep them out of this place for a while for me, uh, you could still be able to go out there and colonize. So I will give them bonus points for that. Industry has lost a man. Those bastards who made AHD weren't content with just getting rid of one of my favorite tech, Freedom of Trade, they have now also decided to completely nerf the Power Branch. To a pretty illogical point, really. 
Now, instead of increasing your factory's output, because, you know, it's a power supply system increase, and this would logically go towards making your factory as well more accessible and more self-reliant, meaning that they would need to take in less resources, all they do now is just increase your output of farms and mines, except for electrical power generation, which covers for one of the former techs. This confuses me. I can see why they got I can see why they nerfed it, but you would logically expect the opposite to happen, that you would lose the mining output and farming output bonuses. Farming output at least, since that makes the least sense of all of them. Uh But no, the opposite happened. They got rid of the uh mainstay of the tech. I just want you to think about this. Farmers now are going to be more excited about having a practical steam engine that does nothing but take up space on their farm because it makes them so much more efficient, while factories still using their water wheel power are never going to be any more efficient until electrical power generation. It boggles the mind. Then again, all the throughput that came out of these now goes to, you know, just putting your factories in the right provinces and linking them up with infrastructure. Aside from that, nothing else has majorly changed except for chemistry and electricity. Even it hasn't really majorly changed, it's just a lot more important now. Oh, mechanization got buffed to go along with it. So, after that long, long explanation, next we're going to politics. Politics has probably changed the least out of any of our, uh... uh any of our basic categories except for movements, and we're going to talk about why they're more important later. Uh, tr population, of course, and trade, nothing major is going to be changed there. Diplomacy, things are a, a lot new. There's a lot new to be had in diplomacy. Let's go to your neighbors real quick. First things first, this is a lot more detailed. Uh, alliance offers, military access offers, and other things that require a mutual agreement now show you yes they will accept or yes they will not accept and show you exactly why instead of just saying they may or may not and just basically throwing the dice on that as we can see here even though our army strength and relations are high with the papal states they are still reluctant to accept, accept us as an ally uh, simply because they just don't see us as that important uh, but we have other places like, not you, Luca, which are, are, uh, well, it's actually the opposite example I wanted to display here. They're, they have political considerations against us, which basically means that they don't think we're going to be a good ally at all, and that they still have the base reluctance. Base reluctance is a little bit confusing for how high it is, but I can sort of understand why, so you don't just go around crazy uh, allying with everyone you see. One thing that is a problem, though, if you ally with a great power, be prepared to never have allies again, essentially. Having, it gets more lax as the game go by, goes by, particularly once you, once you get the ability to cause great wars. But even your own spherelings will be afraid of you because you got too many GP allies eventually. In fact, after even one at the game start. Uh, military, we already talked about this, except for the Navy. Uh, to go over everything now, uh, your ships are still pretty much in logical progression to an extent. There's one new ship, the Battleship, which is essentially a lighter version of the Dreadnought that takes up less supplies and etc. Uh, do keep note of that firing range thing, we're going to be talking about that as soon as I clean up here. Uh, as for everyone else, uh, let's see... The sailing ships are all untouched. Steamer transports, iron, uh, ironclads, monitors, and dreadnoughts are basically untouched except for notice that they require ports with level X or greater. Um, the important thing to note now is that, of course, commerce freighters and cruisers can use torpedoes in battle, which they will do on their own will. Firing range is what uh, we are really here to talk about, to talk about, as well as some of these other new stats. The firing range. Uh, how do I put this? You, if you actually are keeping up and bot HOD, it's almost a given that you watch the trailers. And considering that you watch the trailers, it's almost a given that you know about the new naval pro 
combat because they were so bleeding proud of that naval combat they put it in every single freaking trailer, every single freaking advertisement, and well, goddamn, it wasn't actually pretty darn effective. The naval combat, actually, you know what? Uh, I'll actually skip out on that, on the actual display of that for a while, but what basically happens now is that there's major phases of a naval battle. Uh, it just goes that you start out uh, looking with your ships searching for each other, then they actually find one and decide who to attack. They will attack in small one-on-ones or crowd on bigger ships now, with of course your screens intercepting to try and protect the bigger ships. And then it's ba and then they actually get into combat, and a lot of that is based upon firing range. If say we have a more major ship, let's say the Fernando the Second. If the Fernando II engages with, say, the Carchilo, the Fernando II's firing range is mildly higher. So if it spots that the Car Carchilo is trying to attack it, it will, in reaction, start firing first, so that while the other ship is still approaching, it gets the opening shots. In addition, I believe we start out... Oh, no we don't. Uh, cruisers do not... Commerfeeders do not stood out with torpedo attacks. But torpedo attacks essentially, they're very light attacks, but it essentially acts like infinite range. So that helps them out a lot, dealing with larger ships, and essentially lets your commer freighters to an extent in the late game act like submarines, which, by the way, sadly still aren't in the game. Boo. So, let's talk about some other things. Colonization, oh by the way, colonization and production, I'm going to go into a lot more detail on that in the next video. This is just like when I went from v Vanilla to A House Divided, this show is going to be all about Heart of Darkness now, so if you're coming out of Heart A House Divided still trying to look for me to you give you some tips, sorry. So, anyway, let's just ignore most the brunt of col colonialism for now, but here's but I'm just going to go on a big ol' rant, and unless you're watching this video from the future where I've already explained colonialism, you've watched a lot of the trailers and a lot of the preliminary ARs and see exactly how it's done, or, you know, you just know already, which is not that bad, I'm just going to assume that it's it basically, how do I put this? I'm going to act like you already know what the colonial system is, but unless you've played the game, you've seen the footage, etc., etc., you're not really going to know I, what I'm really talking about, so if you don't really get it, don't worry too much about that. Okay. First things first is this shit. I'm, I'm even going to give in, and even though I was just a resistor of this at first saying, oh, it's to an extent historically accurate, accurate, blah, 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 Dominions are just released way too much at the beginning of the game by AI. The way the colonial system works, and we're going to be getting to that, by God we are, uh, basically means that you're, the AI will always judge colonies as more of a risk than a uh, safe investment and just release, release, release like crazy. Not even the ones with proper cores. Uh, which, by the way, I would at least suggest that if you want to make... If you want to make it so the AI likes to release a lot of places, fine. Make it so that if nations start out with cores on it, like South Africa, and the entirety of the cores are filled, then the AI is more willing to release it as a satellite state due to, you know, the advantage that having cores on the nations get. Versus, you know, you not having cores on the nation and losing such nice values. So, with that now all being said, they will just release and release and release them like crazy. This is the first day of playing already. Mozambique and Angola have been released, as well as British Columbia, well, not first day, first month, British Columbia and Australia. And another major problem that's going to happen on top of this is that places like British Australia and British Columbia, eventually, despite what you may think, Britain has not given up on Australia. They're going to come back later, when they get the proper technologies, they're gonna colonial. They're gonna colonize the inland parts of the actual dominion, the Gibson's Desert, uh, well, the Outback Desert, and these little places right here. And they're gonna keep them due to the fact that they have already released Australia as a colony and released British Columbia as a colony. They start out with non-civilized cores as well. 
it's just going to mean that the, co the colonies are just going to look dumb because they're not actually going to hold all their re re uh, regions. You can already see that happening down here at Mo in Mozambique. How it's not fully c colonialized, but Portugal is about to step in and do so. And they're just going to start releasing, either releasing more dominions or keeping landlocked inland territory to themselves. I don't even so much mind the fact that they're releasing so many colonial nations so early, but it, there just needs to be some sort of system where you can give these inland ugly provinces back to the little dominions you've made. I also believe that there should be some upper limit of actual dominion size. Like, say, Mozambique would be a good example. It was, of course, one of the la largest directly administered African colonies. Uh, second only to Anglo Egypt Sudan and uh, the Belgian Congo. But, uh, like, how do I put this? It was always, like, if Portugal colonizes Zambia, Mozambique, due to its similar, you know, region and its culture, etc., etc., would be considered one nation, while Zambia another. So, Portugal, but in the game, Portugal releases Mozambique if they got Zambia colonized, and especially if they got... Zambia... Zim Zimbabwe colonized, and especially if they have Zambia colonized, they're going to release every single linking territory to their actual empire. Which means that you can get crazy crap to happen. There's already a screenshot on the forms of the French AI having released a so-called free country, free country of South Cameroon that composes of basically all of starting Africa. That's insane. They would never release a colony that big unless they're the Kaiser Reich and Darkest Hour, in which case they would very much do so for reasons that still elude me as to why it actually happened. In addition, they will also re release completely inappropriate dominions. Portugal or France will almost always kick out the game by releasing India from their little one province minor colonies in the namesake region, which completely ruins any other nation's chance of actually forming it, which means that Punjab, Kalat, etc. are pretty much broken right now. Huh. So speaking of broken, let's talk about the colonial point system. It rails the game. Great powers and secondary powers, how do I put this? As I said to a few people, you definitely need to be a secondary or great power by the time the colonial race actually starts, or else you are never going to get to an actual GP position. Colonial prestige, of course, is a lot higher now. The ability to colonize is still dictated by, you know, being a secondary or great power. Uh, smaller nations will not get any more... Uh, colonial points, as per usual. The problem now comes in the fact that a lot of the potential nations that you can play as don't actually come into power until long after this actually passes. What this means is that great powers that are great when the and secondary powers that are secondary when the colonization starts are going to get these massive leads on basically every other nation, and it's going to lead to basically completely ahistoric scenarios. Uh, one, like, say... The Nordic countries. Scandinavia took basically no part in the race for Africa except for some very early colonies in the very early days, such as Dutch Ghana down here. But it's not like when the Great Powers started colonizing these areas that they just turned into third world countries and just started losing very poorly. And that can be, that's just a big old, that's basically what happens. If you're not a colonial power by the time colonizing starts, you're done you're basically excluded from GP Club forever. This also leads to a few... This is also caused by a few problems with the alliance system. The USCA, for instance, due to the friendliness of Mexico and Colombia from the game start, will basically always find itself very quickly in a scenario where it will have to fight two at once, which due to the fact that Guatemala and the, US and the rest of the Central American states are no longer that great at having national focuses, uh, really hurts the USCA a lot. In fact, it went from being my favorite country to hardly being in my top 10 just from HOD simply because you're no longer going to be able to pick Colombia or Mexico off alone. Almost the whole game, they're going to be combined and you just simply cannot beat a combined force coming from the North and the South. And, of course, 
since you cannot really support a navy due to the more expense, which is what we're getting to right after this, you're not going to be able to easily colonize anymore. So you're basically doomed. Unless you pull something out very, very quickly and very effectively against both Colombia and Mexico, and that's generally not going to be a thing that happens. It's, Mexico is just far too powerful, even alone, to take on at the start of the game. So you pretty much are just railed into the actual history of just sitting there and lounging in obscurity, if not just falling apart as in what happened in real life. Unlike before, where you could, in fact, I've made on many occasions back in AHD and Vanilla turned into the biggest great power. So, with that now, with that mouthful now being said, Let's go to our final point to make about Heart of Darkness. Your navies are just too friggin' expensive! This basically means that you have to choose between having a good land army and a good naval army. You can never do anything like the German Empire did before World War I without a MASSIVE economy! You just can't really effectively balance army and navy so well just because your navy is so expensive. Which also means that Logically, nations with a stronger land army, you know, the logically stronger nations, are generally not going to have too many colonies, basically ever. And what few they have, they're going to basically need to dominion and dominion like crazy, or else they're going to run out of colonial points pretty fast, because it's the only way to get colonial points. You do start out with a fair 100, that really doesn't last you the whole race, though. So, I can sit here and go on all day with other little nitpicks and ahistorical parts and the fact that Jamayan is the only country that they added in the entire game with the expansion as opposed to like the billion that were added with and in the course of, uh, well not as a what am I thinking, with and in the course of A House Divided, but that's really a story for another time. Would I support this? buying this. Yeah, I sort of would, to be honest. Uh, it just, it's really not as big of a leap from a, from VIG to AHD, and it really does have some downsides right now, but it's almost definitely going to be patched, and heck, it's a Paradox expansion. Of course it's going to be worth your money. It always bleeding well is. So, with that being said, what this, of course, means that Let's Explain Victoria 2 is now going to resume. Next episode is going to be all about economy and colonialism in HOD. See you then!